All right. Well, I see the participant number continue to tick up, uh, but as we welcome more people, I will uh, kick us off here today. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us to this event, which uh, we will be celebrating and informing on the launch of the Geo-Enabled Microplanning Handbook. We thank you for your time and your attention. We hope we can provide you with uh, both an educational, uh, inspirational uh, talk today. Um, so uh, we will go through a series of uh, speakers and presentations. Uh, we have a very full agenda uh, with around a dozen people who are going to be contributing today. Uh, we'll get to the full agenda uh, coming up in, in a few minutes, uh, but I just wanted to mention that um, if you have questions for us, if you have uh, comments, uh, you can um, use the, the Q&A feature uh, here and we will um, try to be addressing those throughout the, the chat and throughout the, the course of the webinar. Um, and at the end, we will provide contact information for how you can uh, contact us uh, and find out more and get your uh, further questions uh, resolved and, and start a dialogue. So um, without further delay, uh, I will pass off here to Rocco Ponciera from UNICEF. Uh, he's the geospatial health specialist and UNICEF's uh, coordinator from uh, on, on this initiative with the handbook. So Rocco, please, uh, over to you. Good morning. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you joining us. Um, my name is Rocco Pansiera. I'm the geospatial health lead in UNICEF uh, New York, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event, to this launch of the Geneable Microplanning Handbook. Uh, UNICEF is uh, co-hosting this event uh, in collaboration with WHO, and I will be joined today by my colleague uh, Ravi Shankar, the head of the uh, WHO GIS Center for Health, with whom we will uh, 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 team tag on this presentation. Um, as we will see in detail, geoenable microplanning is uh, the application of geospatial data and technologies to improve the planning, delivery, and monitoring of health services. And uh, in the last decade, the utilization of geospatial data and technologies for microplanning has seen an increasing interest uh, from countries and from uh, consequently from development partners. Uh, including pioneering applications for polio eradication and malaria programs, amongst others. Uh, however, microplanning is not specific to these programs and therefore establishing the suitable capacity to geo-enable the microplanning process is seen as a stepping stone for improving the coverage of a, 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 an array of primary healthcare uh, services. Uh, more recently, uh, mainly due to the COVID-19 pandemic, there's been a growing global demand and interest in the area even more so. Uh, to respond to this demand, uh, WHO and UNICEF established two years ago the GIS uh, Working Group for COVAX Innovation under the umbrella of the uh, COVAX facility, uh, which worked uh, for the past two years to streamline GIS support to country uh, on application and geospatial data and technologies for distribution of deliver and delivery of COVID-19 vaccines. The, this handbook that we're presenting today was born out of this context and specifically to fill an existing perceived gap for a practical uh, operational step-by-step -step cookbook to support countries um, uh, implement a uh, number of activities necessary to uh, deploy geospatial data and technologies for microplanning, operationalize them, uh, and sustain um, the process through their um, capacity and in their health information systems. Uh, as we will see, this work builds on the knowledge of hundreds of experts and draws on lessons learned in the previous applications in a number of countries. Uh, next slide, please. 
looking at the agenda for today, um, after a welcome from uh, representatives from the various coordinating orga organizations, uh, Ravi and myself will provide an overview of the content of the handbook, as well as uh, cover a number of activities that are in the pipeline to complement uh, this um, document. We will then have a 30 minute session with a series of lightning talks from a number of organizations that have contributed country use cases that are featured in the handbook. Uh, we'll provide some practical perspectives on the journeyable micro planning process in several health programs. Next slide, thank you. This document has been supported in various ways by several organizations, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Global Fund, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, the Center for Disease Control and World Bank, demonstrating the uh, substantial uh, importance of this topic in the global geospatial health agenda. I would also like to extend a special thank to the Health Geolab Collaborative, now part of the uh, Moru Tropical Health Network, for the substantial technical contribution to this document. Uh, and to Dev Global for facilitating various phases of the conceptualization and creation. And finally, a big thank you to all the technical experts and country implementers that have contributed, content reviewed, drafts, and otherwise provided advice. So with that, I will hand over to Chris to uh, lead us forward. Thank you, Rocco, for the introduction and welcome for everyone. Uh, we will move next to uh, a series of, of welcomes and introductions from some of the key partners and stakeholders that helped us to organize, motivate, uh, coordinate, and, and launch this product. Uh, so we will start with Karine Gashen, the Digital Health Information and HIS Senior Manager from Gavi. Karine, please. Thank you very much, Chris. And um, honestly, today I'm very, very excited. I'm working at Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. And uh, you know, this uh, um, great handbook is a critical piece for vaccination. So we have launched in Gavi a new uh, digital health and information strategy and all the geospatial related intervention have been recognized as um, able to really contribute to improving immunization coverage and especially uh, improving our reach to zero dose children. Children have never been vaccinated. So we are really thrilled and really happy. This handbook is great, very actionable, uh, very concrete and illustrated with uh, nice uh, concrete country stories. So we hope that, uh, you know, every partners and uh, can support all the country we support to operationalize, to use that handbook to improve the digital micro planning for vaccination. I really want to say a huge thank you for WH and UNICEF and all uh, the other Alliance partners and all the contributors. They have been doing not only a great job, but a great job in a very difficult time during the pandemic. And I really wanted to acknowledge the effort of everyone. Thank you and best of luck to the handbook that everyone can use now. Thank you, Karine. Um, Molly, I don't see you on the call. If you are here, please uh, let us know. But uh, while we're waiting, we will move on to our colleagues at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the U.S., Amber Dismer and Louis Rosenkranz. Thank you so much. Uh, as part of the CDC team that's been reviewing and providing uh, input into this handbook and a core member of the GIS COVAX technical working group, we are both delighted uh, at today's launch. It's so encouraging to have this hands-on handbook to discuss integrating geospatial data and GIS technologies into microplans. Uh, at CDC, we work side by side uh, with all of the with many of these core partners, including ministries of health, uh, WHO, UNICEF, um, and many more, um, to be able to increase vaccination coverage and equitable distribution, especially ensuring that the hard to reach vulnerable populations are considered. Uh, we are thrilled again at the spotlight um, on how to collect and update uh, this core data in a geospatial way, whether that's including a georeferenced master uh, facility list of, vac of health facilities or vaccination sites in planning, as well as when you have these unknown villages adding latitude and longitude uh, to them, 
all the way to creating vaccination coverage survey, uh, vaccination coverage uh, boundaries. Um, while this was written in the co context of COVID-19 pandemic and for strengthening delivery and, and monitoring va of vaccinations, we believe that this handbook is useful across the public health system in many areas. That's why I invited so many people that were across the public health uh, spectrum. It outlines these primary geospatial data sources and most likely places you can find them. Also, the level of effort, staffing, and re training required uh, to include GIS in your plans and advantages to doing so. We really hope that uh, you see your country's situation reflected in the use cases today and that this sparks a desire to explore more. Uh, so whether you're helping teams uh, monitor vaccination coverage during a district vaccination campaign, or maybe you're located at the health facility uh, seeking to improve the targeted uh, 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 the targeted reach of services, um, this guide has examples for you. And we hope that as you dive in and hear about today's use cases, these are inspiring because maybe version two will highlight your use case. So again, it's so wonderful to celebrate this achievement today with all of you um, and to welcome you into the GIS community. Uh, we welcome future feedback and that know that this geospatial uh, community stands ready to support you. Uh, thanks so much. Over to you, Louis. Thank you, Amber. Uh, well said, and I don't have very much to add to that. I'm, I'm very excited about this as well. Um, you know, for the first time to have a globally uh, accepted uh, unified document that will uh, provide important guidance for this microplanning. So uh, again, thank you, Amber, and um, uh, this is very exciting. Over. Thank you, Amber and Louis. Uh, we echo your enthusiasm and support for this, and, and thank you for uh, your continued participation. Uh, next up is Steve Ebener uh, from Health Geo Lab uh, Collaborative and Moru, and he's uh, both a key uh, sort of organizing uh, partner as well as a technical expert that heavily contributed to the document. So, Steve, over to you. Thanks, Chris, and, and good day, everyone. Um, we are also very pleased at Moru to have had the uh, opportunity to contribute uh, to the writing of this handbook and to celebrate its launching uh, today with all of you. Um, for us as countries are preparing not only for the next potential pandemic, but also other more local, slow or rapid onset disasters, are also monitoring or eliminating communicable diseases and aiming at improving planning. It's critical not to forget about the key role that geography and therefore geospatial data and technologies can play across all of these programs. So together with other documents on which it builds, uh, the handbook help organizations like ours to support countries, not only with the geo-enablement of their microplans, but also of the entire health system. Another important thing for us is uh, the fact that the handbook emphasized the need for a common framework to be used by all partners, for countries to really fully benefit from the geo-enablement of their health programs, and respective information system. At the Health Geo Lab, we have been promoting the HIS Geo Enabling Framework in Asia and Pacific for the past five years, and we are pleased, of course, that it's being used as the reference in the handbook. We strongly believe that the implementation of a common framework such as this one can uh, greatly improve geographically based decision making and lead to a more system based, comprehensive comprehensive, sorry, and long-term approach to addressing public health problems. Um, that kind of convergence and the use of common geography by all public health programs in general, and for micro-planning in particular, can make great strides toward achieving this important goal. So we're very excited to have been able to contribute to this initiative and look forward now to be able to contribute also to the implementation of the content of the handbook. Thank you. Very much appreciated, Steve, and thank you. Um, don't know if Molly has joined. Uh, please correct me if you are here, but I, I will just say that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's geospatial and GIS team has been instrumental from the beginning of the conceptualization and the organization of this. We thank them for their uh, their contributions and support throughout uh, this process. Um, so. Uh, next, we can move into the heart of this uh, webinar and launch the, the presentation for the handbook. 
Uh, starting here will be the head of uh, the WHO GIS Center for Health, Ravi Shankar, uh, who can tell us about um, what is uh, GIS microplanning, geo-enabled microplanning, and how this handbook will help us to uh, support that within the countries that we serve. Ravi, over to you. Thanks, Chris. Next slide, please. Thank you. The question is, what is a microplan? This is for people who are, who are hearing this for the first time, or I see there's a lot of participants here for this webinar. Might be some of you might not have heard about this terminology microplan. Two years ago, when I started in polio eradication, the question, first question when microplan came was, is there a macro plan? Uh, was the first question I uh, it came to my mind. I think in that context, yes, there's a macro plan. Um, uh, we uh, call it uh, like an NDVP national development vaccine plan for the uh, for the COVID thing. So it takes off the big picture of how much vaccines are needed and 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 what is the resource needed, how many cold chains. It is a, it goes into the higher level details. But when you come focus into at the district or the health facility level, that's where the real micro plan comes. It really says that it's the last mile decision making support tool. And it can be used in many contexts, so it's a very broad definition. It will not be fitting into one clear definition of what a microplan is. It can help to identify populations, access barriers, um, utilization of the resources, work plans, solutions. So it's it's it, it's a wide spectrum uh, of of um, entities joined together as called as a microplan. Next slide, please. Yes. Uh, I think we had uh, already heard from our, our speakers that that it is used it could be used or it is used in many other uh, 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 areas. Initially, it started with polio, then uh, it expanded to other areas, and it slowly, slowly um, uh, uh, felt the need to be used in many contexts. Um, um, uh, COVID was a recent example, and and it really played a, a big role in that. Next slide, please. Okay. What is a, um, uh, a geo-enabled microplan? It's as simple as that. So it's a service delivery, right? It's very clear you're trying to deliver some services. In polio, we had door-to-door -door campaign. A campaign is a place where um, a vaccinator takes a bag and he goes to every household and checks if there is a um, children at the age of, under the age of five and give vaccination, two drops of vaccines in the mouth and comes back. So to do that, he actually had to have his route map and planning, right? Every day morning, he assembles in the uh, in the health facility and he says, okay, this five-day campaign, day one, I need to go here, day two, I need to go there, day three, four, five. This is how it happens. So it's more like house-to-house -house thing. And conversely, in, 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 in other contexts of routine immunization, you'd like uh, the... Um, uh, people to come to the health facility. It means you want them to come to the health facility. Many times I talk about this, even there was a uh, uh, opportunity to meet our director general, Dr. Tedros. In that um, scenario, we are discussing about this, um, about like a, a McDonald's. A McDonald's is a service entity, of course, the uh, entity which always never fails in countries because they exactly know where to put their health no, their their facility. Similar to that, um, um, uh, also we'd like to have the health facilities placed in the exact right location to serve the population. And to do that, traditionally we were doing in hand uh, hand drawn things. This is one example of a thing taken from from uh, uh, Somalia when in Mogadishu it was a very challenging area when we had the you know, uh, outbreak. Um, now then we were uh, discussing about this and we asked them. We, we call this a handshake. Can you walk to the end of your, your territory and give a handshake with somebody else from the next territory? The reasoning why we do that is to make sure that um, you know, there is no gaps or overlaps between, between, between their um, vaccinators. Then the concept moves into a digital one. Digital one, there are only five components, very easy, satellite imagery. It's a base on which we operate the entire thing. Then you have uh, the location of the health facility. And then you have where people live, the spatial population of where people live. Then you have a catchment boundary. Then you have your travel time. Because as I said, in the routine immunization, we are expecting people, a mother to take the child and come to the nearest health facility. So it has to be within the range of um, a, a walkable or an easy transportable thing. So it's a, it's, it's a tool which can also uh, help in every uh, 
from the planning to the implementation to the evaluation and monitoring, every stage of the cycle of the, of the uh, uh, field campaign, this can help. So you use all these five components together and you enrich to, to do your uh, uh, analysis. So that is as simple as enabling, geo-enabling uh, a typical traditional micro plan. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, to start um, the process, um, uh, I'm going to go through this one more slide where we are going through five step process, but just there's common challenges to start with this, right? Maybe I can go from any direction. Uh, the first is the availability of the good quality georeference data. If you don't have that base foundational data, I don't think you cannot, you cannot, um, I, I remember one of our colleagues used to mention um, uh, from the foundation, if you do not exist in a map, you are, you are let out from the service delivery. So it's as simple as this, that we need to have a strong foundational data set. Then we want, we'd like to have a great co uh, country ownership. Everything uh, comes from the ownership uh, uh, from, the, from the national government. The more the country takes ownership on this, we have seen many success or um, uh, successful uh, implementation. Um, the other challenge we see this is, um, technical capacity at the country level. As I said, these um, uh, digital enabled or, or geo enabled micro plan was done in polio in outbreak situation. It means you take a big country, you do one part of the country or one section where there's an outbreak going. So that means you're able to put full of your resources at that one concentrated area and get the result out of it. But in a scenario of um, uh, routine immunization or, 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 or COVID vaccination, your focus is the entire country. So you, the resource needed is so high, and also the technical capacity to have um, people understand the concept of micro plan and to be able to implement that digital micro plan was a big, big uh, challenge. And um, as I said, because it was initially used in uh, outbreaks, then we are trying to do it now in routine immunization to mainstream it. But the sustainability is always a question, right? Because a special population um, uh, dynamics changes, the locations of facility changes, new population come in. So all these things have to be kept on maintaining and updated. So the, the long-term sustainability is also a big challenge. In this. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. Um, that led into, as, as Roko mentioned very clearly, we were, we were discussing this. When we wanted to uh, have this working group and things, we should live a, a product which could benefit the whole community. That's how the whole thing of, of this handbook came into picture. So the clear objective of this uh, handbook is fourfold. One is to talk about the concepts behind the geo-enablement of, of the, of the microplan. The second one is, describe the objective characteristic and key components to have a sustainable geo-enabled microplan. I think I did mention briefly about that. The third one is to have the, uh, it's more like a cookbook, right? From start to end, you should have, um, uh, uh, if, I'm, if I'm a manager, if I'm an implementer, if I'm a decision maker, I should know uh, how I could, I could uh, uh, go through the process and uh, from A to Z and be able to implement it. And finally, this handbook also nicely had <laughs> Five, six examples, a practical example for, for, uh, for um, uh, people's benefit. Next slide, please. Okay, so this summarizes the whole thing. On the left-hand side, it looks a lot of text there, but I'll, I'll simplify with uh, um, the five points there. First is the challenges, that's what we saw there. So to understand the context, the challenges, what geography we are operating, um, what is a bounding box, what is the, uh, um, the uh, terrain, all those understanding is the um, uh, first step. The second is to uh, assess the geo-enabling part of the microplanning process. So it means even if you're not geo-enabling that, it means the microplan is going to go ahead, right? Because they need to vaccinate, they need to do all of the steps A to Z. But how do we geo-enable in every components of that? Uh, when you do a campaign, there's a pre-checklist, there's a during the campaign checklist, there's a post-checklist. In every process, how do you actually enable the geospatial component? And so that is the second part of it. The third one is to develop a work plan. So 
have a detailed work plan uh, and and expected outcomes and uh, budget and everything is listed out it, it depends on the size of the country the number of facilities the spatial population everything is what will be uh, 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 contributing to that then it's implementing these work plan what it is decided and it's done over a period of um, uh, time it's it's not a uh, uh, unending uh, process it's a very short process generally we take one month before before the start of the uh, uh, campaign or a focused uh, period of one to two months and we try to um, uh, enable this within that that time span but in countries of course the process takes some time five months six months also it takes based on the uh, the capacity the absorption capacity at that level the finally is how do you do uh, sustain it how do you mainstream it how do you make sure that um, what the benefit is reach, uh, reap for the for the uh, um, malaria can be used for other programs that sort of thing is the final step and on the right hand side is the framework the entire framework we have gone through this in many other projects right now i think this is the core thing of this um uh, we call it as strategic pathways and other examples in the un they called us uh, iga framework so it is the whole um, uh, 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 framework through which the whole micro plan will be implemented at the at the, at the country level next slide please okay just few highlights of this um, um, handbook then i'll i'll leave the floor to Roku. so there are four main uh, areas of of um, of or uh, uh, attention we could say the first one is is very modular uh, approach for a wide uh, audience it means it could be for it, it is focusing both technical, non-technical, senior management. So it covers a, a wide spectrum of audience. The, then is the, the four main applications of the geospatial data technology for microplanning. So we are we are doing about uh, health facility master list, which is very uh, critical for the whole process, population, spatial population, uh, accessibility, routing, that, and thematic mapping. So these are the four applications in that, and six use cases. And then we also included a component on monitoring, evaluation, and learning. Uh, with this one, I'll uh, give the floor to uh, Roko. Please move to the next slide. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ravi. Uh, I'd like to go a little bit more into details about the type of information provided in the handbook uh, very briefly. Uh, overall, there's a, a lot of practical guidance um, to guide um, Reader through the various steps of uh, this process that uh, Ravi has highlighted. And the guidance in, is presented both in the form of step-by-step step step instructions, as well as uh, various diagrams and charts that and toolkits that can guide the re realization of the steps, of which you can see some, uh, just some examples uh, here in no, no particular order. Um, at the starting point of this process, the reader is led through a number of steps to establish the fundamental information that are that is needed to design the program uh, and, and to design a program that will respond to the contextual needs and, uh, of, of the country. This includes uh, practical guidance on identifying the challenges faced by the microplanning process and by aligning um, a specific uh, geospatial data and technology solution to those challenges. Uh, again, practical tools are provided to um, go through this process. Um, uh, the, uh, there's also guidance around um, understanding the documenting the geography of the microplan, a, a crucial steps uh, where the geographic objects that are relevant to the program and have specific programs that we're, we're doing the microplanning for um, are relevant to, and I will therefore need to be represented in the GIS system uh, through data. Um, this will then lead to ste the steps to assess and uh, document the availability, quality, and accessibility of the relevant data. And as well as, as mentioned uh, already a couple of times, the assessment of the maturity of the genetically environment, uh, which um, ensures that the process that is implemented is cognizant of the specific country context in terms of technical capacity, uh, data availability, but also in terms of the institutional supporting framework. Next slide, please. The four main applications of uh, that are um, uh, featured in the book 
uh, which in combination, generally in combination, support the micro planning uh, are described in detail. Um, however, the information is distributed so as to be relevant to the specific phase of the journaling process. For example, you know, at the first stage of planning, the, the purpose, audience, and, and, and details and the methodology are described in broad terms. Uh, then um, guidance is then provided on the definition of the content and specific formats uh, of the products that we produced once the, the needs and the users have been identified so that the, 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 the right products are uh, developed for the right audience, for the right needs. Then guidance is provided on uh, assessing data availability and quality uh, once the process is at the stage of uh, implementation. And practical considerations are suggested in relation to the uh, operational deployments of these various applications and uh, in relation to the operationalization. Uh, in later parts of the documents, uh, there's also guidance around uh, sustaining the, um, the use, the update, uh, and the um, storing and maintaining of the uh, data and products. Next slides, please. Uh, beyond the specific guidance on the technical products, the realization operalization, the, the handbook uh, dedicates significant attention to the range of activities that will be needed to uh, the, to lay down a country level uh, work plan for the full realization of the enabling process. This includes, for example, guidance on uh, uh, establishing the governance or coordinating body that will oversee the enabling process. Um, it includes the terminal. Uh, adequate scale for implementation, whether it is a pilot project in a few districts uh, or a larger uh, uh, region uh, deployment um, or a, a national level deployment in optimistic cases. Um, additionally, uh, guidance is provided on identifying technical expertise, the training needs, the hardware and software requirements, uh, and other um, important activities, including uh, developing a budget and costing um, the whole process. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, finally, a number of country examples are detailed in the handbook, uh, and we really uh, wanted to ensure that uh, uh, the guidance is coupled with uh, examples on how um, just special data technology succeeded um, in supporting micro planning in a number of countries. Um, the the, the, the six, six country examples are featured um, across a variety of geographies and program, uh, and we will shortly hear from some of the authors. Um, in order to, to provide standardized information, the country deep dives in the handbook have been structured uh, with similar elements, including uh, not only a description of the process and methods, the stakeholders involved um, and uh, specific description as well of the programmatic outcomes achieved. Uh, in some cases, they will be associated to the, the impact on the micro planning process itself, with the efficiency uh, of the resource optimization or similar. And in other cases, uh, uh, it might be tangible outcomes uh, like improving vaccination coverage um, and, um, uh, and so on. Uh, and finally, we asked co-author to list key learnings uh, that uh, from the program that will really hopefully be useful uh, to uh, inform the replication of uh, this in other contexts in conjunction with the handbook. Next slide. Uh, UNICEF and WHO will continue working on a number of activities to complement the handbook. Uh, we are planning to, uh, of course, roll out the handbook in a number of countries, uh, mainly to, uh, or the secondary objective to evaluate its usability by country stakeholders uh, for planning and implementation. Um, there are a number of countries that are at the stage of establishing a work plan for enable micro planning programs. Uh, and we expect that this activity uh, will hopefully also lead to an improved document. 
Um, we are also actively uh, working on an e-learning course that will translate the content of the handbook into self-paced modules in available in multiple languages uh, that will be posted on uh, a number of um, uh, global learning platforms. And uh, we're also looking to develop a interactive budgeting tool that will simplify uh, the uh, guidance on the costing that in, included in the handbook through a um, uh, web-based uh, interactive tool, allowing country to create a uh, realistic and comprehensive budget, uh, including all the activities that are um, uh, required. As we see the gap, uh, frequently in um, countries when um, applying for funding uh, for micro planning. We will, we will continue to make these tools available on the COVAX GIS Work Group website that is linked here, uh, where you can find a number of other related resources and, and, and contacts uh, with uh, WC. Uh, with that, I'll hand over back to our chair. Uh, Chris, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Rocco and Ravi. Um, and so, you know, the the two of you have been um, champions and, and leaders on this initiative uh, since the beginning um, and guided this uh, through the long process. Uh, and we're very grateful for that leadership, that expertise, and for uh, the, your participation in, in presenting to, to the, all of our stakeholders here today. The next section of our talk will be a series of three minute lightning talks where we will uh, have presentations on the particular use cases from the handbook. So uh, in uh, Annex B at the end of the handbook, we've highlighted several different example cases of how uh, parts of geo-enabled microplanning have been used in the past across a range of diseases and interventions. Uh, and we have a, a series of speakers here with us today uh, that can uh, begin with that. So next slide, please. Uh, the first guest I would like to welcome is Keba Toure. Um, many of you know him, I'm sure. He's um, the manager of the AfroGIS Center uh, and is uh, going to present on the GI enabled microplanning for polio supplemental immunization activities in Nigeria. Keba, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, good uh, afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, process and thanks for the opportunity uh, to share Nigeria's use case for polio eradication in terms of uh, GIS micro planning. Just to highlight that um, I'm making this presentation to several people, partners, uh, colleagues um, who have contributed immensely, especially with the leadership from the National Nigeria Primary Healthcare Development Agency, MPXCDA, uh, over the years, uh, that made this a huge success in the country. Um, thank you. Uh, Microplanning, as you've heard uh, from the introductions, is a key component for us uh, at, uh, to conduct polio uh, supplemental immunization activities. First and foremost, before you give vaccines to kids, you need to know where these children live. And this is where microplanning uh, becomes handy. When we started this initiative way back in Nigeria, um, we realized the use of hand-drawn paper maps for microplanning, as you can see um, highlighted on this slide here. Um, in most cases, hand-drawn maps are usually not complete and in some cases inaccurate, and they are unable to also capture all the settlements uh, that are supposed to be part of uh, these various team areas. And as a result, you will see team areas one, two, three, four, four, five, and so on and so forth. So when, when we came in first, we had to make sure uh, that uh, we shift uh, from hand-drawn maps to what we call GIS maps, you will see in the next slide, next. So when, when we did uh, this initiative, as you will see on this other map, uh, we asked uh, uh, the areas where this innovation was piloted mainly in the Northern states of Nigeria at the time we carried the heavy body of poliovirus um, circulation in the country. We requested the same um, work for Calpazin to delineate their same team areas on the GIS microplanning maps you will see on two. You realize uh, some gaps in terms of missing settlements, which means the paper maps we are not capturing uh, to a large extent all the settlements that are meant to be part of the team areas. And this is where GIS mapping comes handy. 
it provides an opportunity for you to identify not only the settlements where these children reside, but of course the health facilities and other points of interest that are also very critical uh, to support the micro planning process. Next slide. Next. Thank you. So, so when these maps are uh, developed, um, um, they were able to, the previous slide, sorry, uh, when these maps are uh, developed, uh, in addition to supporting the house to house polio campaigns, uh, they were also used uh, to support uh, um, um, routine immunization, micro planning processes, for example, IPV. You are able to identify health facilities and then create some buffers around those health facilities to determine um, the number of people living in that area. And again, in terms of health camps, you are able to use these GIS maps um, to, to delineate uh, health camp areas. And that makes it very efficient and easy for you to plan your know, various vaccination activities. Then moving forward, uh, these maps uh, were also very pivotal in terms of using one of our key innovations at the time in Nigeria called the vaccination tracking system, where we use uh, mobile phones uh, with applications installed and then given to each uh, vaccination team to identify the areas that they are supposed to cover. And at the end of day one, two, three, four, uh, more of activities are implemented. So before this initiative, uh, more of activities could be just random. You can ask your team members to go back and some of them would go uh, to the same areas uh, to where they have already visited. But with this GIS micro planning map, which are developed, you are able to highlight very clearly which settlements have been missed, which settlements have been covered, and then during mop up, we are able to guide the vaccination teams to go to those settlements. Next slide. So, so what this uh, micro planning uh, process helps us is, of course, there is a need to also be updating uh, this micro planning map. So, what we noticed in Nigeria at the time, especially in some of the states where we implemented this innovation, uh, we monitored over time, at least the last three campaigns. Uh, we identify settlements that have been consistently missed by vaccination teams. Of course, we wanted to know why. And these settlements were called chronically missed settlements. Uh, we upload this uh, on tablets. As you can see, we call the, uh, the innovation Hamlet Buster and then train the word focal persons to locate these settlements, ensuring that these settlements are indeed covered in subsequent rounds. What we found out briefly in some of those settlements, as you see on one of the pictures, zero those children. The word focal passing would either say, I never knew this settlement is part of my uh, ward, and another one would say, I thought it, it belongs to the neighboring ward. Of course, there are other settlements that have been deserted, but we are still able to uh, locate uh, this type of settlement, which means with this information also connected to this Hamlet poster, you are able to update your micro plan. So, which means the micro planning process is not a one off process, it is a continuous process. Uh, people will keep moving, new settlements may come up. Uh, you may need to delineate uh, new team areas to rationalize your team load, ensuring that uh, the vaccination teams are giving areas that are able to cover effectively. And the good thing about the GIS micro plan is for polio, every last child counts. So it means uh, wherever a settlement is, regardless of the distance, you need to ensure you reach these settlements. And uh, it is only through this GIS based micro planning that you can guide your teams effectively to cover this settlement. So this innovation, this initiative, as I said, um, was um, implemented uh, as a collaborative mechanism. Um, several partners, uh, WHO, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the Nigeria Private Healthcare Development Agency, UNICEF, CDC, WT, eHealth, a lot of other stakeholders contributed immensely to this success. And I think up till now, these maps continue to be used for other health interventions and for sustainability, this is very critical for this geo-enabled micro-planning process. Thank you, over to you, Chris. Thank you so much, Keba, uh, for the information and for your participation, uh, both here and throughout the process of creating the handbook. Uh, the next lightning talk will be uh, from Nazir Halaru, uh, the Nigeria country manager for grid three. Yeah, thank you so much, Chris. And um, good morning, good afternoon to everyone on the call. Uh, it's really glad to be here and thank you for um, considering me to make a presentation here. So I'll be talking about the spatial data and digital maps for um, Nigeria. Nigeria currently has four core fundamental geospatial data layers, as you can see on settlement population, administrative boundaries, and POIs infrastructure. 
you know, which we initially, uh, and then we initially got involved in the COVAS work in Nigeria through the Presidential Tax Force on COVID-19 in order to help the highest level body of decision making to optimize resources uh, for the COVID-19 through the evidence and synthesis group of the Presidential Committee. This uh, started in April 2020, and we further down the line engaged directly with the MPSCDS uh, National Technical Working Group on COVID-19 vaccination in order to get their needs at the national down to the local government level uh, on the needed just partial data for the enable micro planning process. Uh, in this case, uh, we developed 774 um, GIS base maps that help micro planning at the LGA level down to the interactive dashboard, uh, which we can see in our next screen that uh, show us how this data could be uh, utilized. So in ensuring the um, uh, cross-cutting benefit of the core uh, just partial data layers, um, this is uh, developed in order to allow the health workers to use this interactive dashboard in order to query the needed data themselves and also uh, in order to improve uh, their coverage. So this, of course, informs uh, a lot of decision making uh, at the at the at the world level and also at the LGA level, as uh, previously been streamlined into different programs, especially the polio SI campaigns, measles and yellow fever uh, campaigns. So the MPSCD launched what is called a mass vaccination campaign in order to improve their coverage. So this dashboard allows them to query this information that they need and also uh, for them to be able to uh, use it to critically identify those missed children, those missed communities, uh, so that they can reach them with the uh, required uh, vaccines. Next slide. Here is a specific illustration of how our systemic approach works. When Nigeria was ready to launch its COVID-19 uh, campaign, the grid three data had already been accepted by the MPSCDA, which uh, was eventually, you know, uh, endorsed by multi-agency steering committee through the national steering and technical committees of the uh, of the government, involving again the National Population Commission, which we work very closely in order to validate our population estimates and also put this into use. So what focal points were able to triple the number of doses their teams administered because they use the dashboard in order to inform their daily implementation plans. So we also followed up at granular level by our partners, the Nigeria CDC, the US CDC Nigeria Country Office, AFNET and also National Primary Healthcare Development Agency in order to um, you know, fully engage the word focal persons to um, you know, um, improve their vaccination coverage. And as you can see from the screen, uh, these are you know, critical outcomes from Adamawa and Kwara State. In Dr. Hadley's words, before March 2022, vaccination teams were deployed to site based on very broad assumptions around need by program managers. However, after the introduction of just partial data and GIS-based tools, you know, we saw weekly vaccination rates more than double across states, with teams sustaining and you know, surpassing daily vaccination target of 60 people per day. This was the target provided by the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, and this has significantly improved you know, the vaccination coverage. And this is currently being used uh, by various programs, the dashboard, in order to improve you know, um, health outcomes, especially uh, through the non-polio SI campaigns and also um, through all that campaigns because uh, the data has been cross-cutting, you know, through the different uh, programs. Thank you and over. Thank you so much. So we will continue on with uh, the next presentation. Uh, can everyone hear me? It says I'm muted, even though I'm not. Let's try again. Yes, we can. Okay, apologies there. Uh, the next presentation is also from Grid3, uh, and we will move over to Garakai Mambeli. Erika, please go ahead when you're ready.
Garika, can can you hear us? All right, he may have frozen. Looks like I'm not seeing any movement in the video. Uh, we will skip ahead to uh, Richard. If would you be available to to go next while we wait for Garakai to uh, come back online? Sure, no problem. Richard Maud from Moru Mahidol Oxford Tropical Medicine Research Unit. Please. Thanks, Chris. Um, so I'm going to tell the story of malaria stratification in Cambodia that we've been supporting since 2019. And this has been on behalf of the Cambodia National Malaria Program. Next slide, please. So it's crucial for Cambodia to stratify the country uh, down to village level for malaria, as they're wanting to target uh, their use of resources to make things as efficient as possible. So it was a key recommendation from the National Program Review in 2019 that they need to do everything down to village level. So where they put village malaria workers, how they deliver bed nets um, to make the best use of available funds. So we worked together with the National Program and partners to come up with a simple method for stratification with um, incidence rates, so number of cases divided by population as a measure of current risk. Um, coverage of forest as a measure of potential risk because in Cambodia, most of the transmission happens in and around forests. And then also the distance to the nearest health facility, because the further from a health facility a village is, the bigger the need for a village malaria worker. So we ran a, a consultative workshop with um, stakeholders. You can see a picture there for some of the participants at the end of 2019 to develop this method. And then we ran a pilot for one, one province. Next slide. And crucial to this was um, that the data needed wasn't there. Um, so the last time the villages had been mapped in Cambodia was 2008, and then they weren't remapped in the 2019 census. So there's an urgent need to collect and update that village list. 10% uh, uh, of the villages in the, the surveillance system uh, were, were missing entirely from the master list, and around 30% were had inaccurate location data. So we supported with a low-cost, rapid method to collect very quickly the locations of the villages across the malaria endemic provinces. And you can see a map in the center from January um, 2021. So that's been updated annually um, and it's done through participatory mapping through health centers and local government. So we've been sending our teams out across the country. Um, they've also been mapping health facilities and then also updating the district boundaries because this information wasn't available. And you can see there some of our teams sitting with local staff doing this mapping, and then that's integrated into the National Malaria Information System, a screenshot down in the bottom right. Next slide. The other missing information was the, uh, the forest map, which there wasn't an accurate map that was up to date, but it was crucial for, for this stratification method. So we worked in partnership with the European Space Agency to do updated analysis of imagery from Sentinel-2 and to, to provide that each year. We had teams on the ground that um, did ground truthing. So they took pictures of locations selected by ESA to see what sort of vegetation was on the ground. You can see some images on the left. And then they used that to train a, to train a model um, through which they analyzed the imagery and then generated this up-to-date annual forest map at high resolution. Next slide. And then the outcomes, this, this has been central to Cambodia's planning. So it's government owned. Uh, it's updated annually with a method that they now entirely own and, and run. Um, and the village stratification is what the malaria information system is currently based around with that master list. Um, it allows quick identification of outbreaks at fine scale and also quick identification of data quality issues. It's greatly increased the trust in the data from um, local staff and health facility staff. They've seen that the, the information is much more accurate than it used to be. Uh, there's much better monitoring and evaluation of VMW and health facility performance. And as a result, there's been very large decreases in malaria since 2019. So they're, they're well on track now for achieving elimination. And it's formed the basis of the national strategic plan and also their current global fund application. So they, they're funding for the next three years. There's a couple of maps on this slide of just how this stratification changes each year. So each of these points is a village and the colors show the, the level of risk for the for those villages, so there's, there's different strata. And just to acknowledge the national program and the various staff involved. Thank you.
Thank you, Richard. Uh, very informative, uh, insightful. Um, and we appreciate your contributions throughout the process of creating the document and, and in this use case as well. Uh, it looks like Garakai's uh, internet situation has resolved. Uh, so we will go back to grid three. Uh, Garakai, please over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, good morning. Good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Garakai Mbele, working with uh, grid three in Zambia. Next slide, please. And next slide. Thank you. Grid 3 has been engaged in Zambia since 2018, collaborating with the various government um, stakeholders on the production and use of high resolution spatial data. In the past five years, we've worked closely with ZAMSTATS, Zambia Statistics Agency, the Ministry of Local Government, the Ministry of Lands, the Invest of Zambia. And another collaboration includes the Ministry of Health's expanded program on immunization, EPI, which involved supporting the country's um, COVID-19 vaccination program rollout. We provided support to the Ministry of Health since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020 to raise awareness of geospatial data for COVID-19 um, response. In February 2022, we started supporting the first phase of COVID-19 micro planning and trainings for healthcare workers, which incorporated the use of geo-enabled micro planning maps. And over 3,100 health workers were trained. These efforts significantly contributed to the achievement of the 70% COVID-19 vaccination target, which was set for October 2022 in Zambia. And we are currently supporting first two micro planning trainings around three COVID-19 campaigns in which nearly 1,000 health workers are expected to be trained. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. The maps provided were tailored to fit uh, EPI's uh, needs in line with the red Rex strategy on which the micro planning template uh, was developed. Geospatial uh, accessibility analysis was conducted to identify um, settlements in line with the outreach strategy based on the distance of communities from health facilities to help um, health workers to plan for service delivery. The maps were embedded in the completed health facility micro plan uh, Excel. That's, um, I think, if you can go back to the previous slides to just help the listeners understand that. Yes, that one, thank you. And an SOP on how to use geospatial maps um, for micro planning was done and shared with the healthcare workers and district officers. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. The geo-enabled maps were integrated into micro plans and EPI's COVID-19 campaigns nationwide. At this moment, 71 districts comprising of 1,669 health facilities have been trained and have access to the geo-enabled maps. One of the most significant impacts of the use of geo-enabled maps uh, thus seen is the identification of communities that were previously missed by other campaigns. An interview conducted with a nursing officer in Kafue district reviewed that maps um, help them to identify previously missed communities in three catchments, which have since been added to the micro plans. Another success is the increased knowledge of Ministry of Health staff on the value and use of geospatial data for improved planning. The knowledge um, has been imparted throughout uh, our engagement with our collaboration with EPI during the day-to-day -day map productions uh, tailor GIS trainings and workshops. At the moment, EPI is working towards um, the integration of COVID-19 vaccinations into routine immunization and uh, primary healthcare services based on the WHO uh, integration guidelines in which geospatial tools will play an important role. These integration guidelines will then be fed into the national immunization strategy for 2022 up to 2026. Next slide. 
If you want to get more details on what I was just talking about, you can follow that video attached. Thank you very much. Thank you, Garagai. Uh, I'm glad your connection resolved and you were able to share that really informative talk with the rest of us. Um, and we thank Grid3 for the continued uh, expertise uh, and then being one of those foundational partners that we've discussed. Next, we move on to Dr. Narottam Pradhan, uh, the Chief of Party from Project Concern International in India. Uh, please, over to you. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I'm happy to share with uh, all of you the, you know, the geo-enabled microplanning process that we applied to improve the routine immunization in Patna, India. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, this was, uh, you know, the context was uh, several, I think it's almost uh, 13, 15 years uh, when, you know, the access we were doing, we were moving from uh, from polio eradication vaccination to routine immunization. And some of the areas that we were having problems were the urban areas, which were constantly growing at that point of time. Patna was the fifth fastest growing, growing urban area in India, uh, which had about 2.5 million population. Uh, but only 31 public vaccination centers. There were nine hospitals and a few NGOs who, who had, which had taken vaccines and would do monthly vaccination. Of course, the hospitals would do uh, vaccination on a, a daily basis. But despite that, you know, the large areas underserved, there were very limited uh, outreach analysis for vaccination. There was almost, uh, you know, negligible vaccination distribution system. Uh, what the NGOs would do would come to the district immunization office, pick up their vaccines and go, but there was no scheduling for that. Uh, you know, when we did a coverage survey, we came to 43% of full immunization for first year of age, and most of these were through private clinics. Uh, I think, as I remember, over 30% were through private clinics. And that's where, you know, I was urged, uh, I was in UNICEF back then, and, you know, I was urged to look for other alternatives of uh, doing urban vaccination. And that's where you know we utilize the GIS and geo-enabled microplanning approach. Next slide. Uh, so you know the first thing that I had in hand was really to get satellite maps because we were, had issues of hand-drawn maps and we were not being able to find the areas. The areas would not talk to each other. We didn't have you know information on where vaccination sites could be planned. So I reached out to you know the government department, which is called Bihar Remote Sensing Application Society, popularly known as Talmandal, and we had some friends in CDC Atlanta who were willing to partner with us in this process. So we acquired satellite maps. We acquired a, a, a tool which is ArcView GIS and and the handheld Grameen uh, GPS uh, instruments, and you know put together a small team and looked at all the options that we had of where to put the vaccination sites at, you know, uh, what's called the Aganwadi centers. We looked at schools. We looked at, you know, uh, ward members' houses. And, and you know, we brainstormed and which has the most extensive reach, particularly to the vulnerable population. And we came, you know, across that maybe the Aganwadi centers are the best. So with a team of just a handful of people, we sent them with this uh, this grabbing uh, instrument. And, and they kind of took GPS coordinates of all of this. And we kind of superimposed that to the satellite maps. And that's what you see, you know, those points came up. And, you know, then, then we kind of looked at, you know, there was some, we decided uh, to, you know, understand what, what these were. Uh, fortunately for us, we had a lot of data on house-to-house -house teams going for polio rounds every month, every other month. So we took some data of all these areas and kind of superimposed that on the map. And so we could understand where, you know, there were significant population, but uh, we didn't have adequate vaccination sites. And you can see that in the third, uh, you know, where we have the reds, are uh, you know, access, uh, uh, inadequate access to vaccination sites. And so we had to, you know, add areas to that. So that was the next step of the process. Then kind of what we did was, you know, we demarcated, there were nine hub hospitals and we kind of demarcated, you know, uh, the, uh, the vaccination sites to these nine areas and uh, saying that, you know, whatever, even if there is population growth, if there is uh, newer areas. So within that demarcation, you were responsible for adding uh, new vaccination sessions. And you can see how Patna was divided into nine vaccination areas. 
Uh, what we then had to do was, you know, we had two more issues. One was really to reach the vaccines to these sites. So fortunately for us, there was this system of outplayed vaccine delivery mechanism, also called courier service, men on motorcycles and cycles, would be ready to deliver vaccines, four to five vaccines, uh, vaccine couriers, car carriers to these different sites. So we kind of plotted with the GIS, you know, and with information from the ground, uh, you know, which would be the most appropriate routes for them to take. And so that was the next step. The final step was, you know, really we had to address human resource challenges because there was, you know, at that point of time, 2007 and eight, they were only for, if I remember well, 13 to 14 auxiliary nurse midwives who were available. So what we actually did was we jumped from 31 to about 600 and, you know, 90 plus sites. So obviously, you know, there was this human resource crunch. So what we had to do was look for alternative days because, uh, you know, the, the regular days for vaccinations were on Wednesdays and Fridays. So we had to borrow some um, uh, nurses from nearby rural areas on non-working days. So we figured out that Monday and Saturday they were free. And then, you know, because to save on the travel time and we had to do two vaccination sessions a day, we actually mapped the residence of these nurses and allocated them 16 sites a month so that they could reach that, uh, you know, those areas two sessions a day. So that's how we kind of utilize the whole geo-enabled micro-planning approach uh, to overcome all these issues. Next slide, please. So what is our learning from this? Our learning is that, you know, with the geo-enabled micro-planning process, we have improved vaccination reach, reach, and you can understand that this went like more than 20-fold improvement. Uh, and of course, you know, there was a reduction in underserved population pockets because we'll identify that with the in the uh, you know, the population clustering and the population access uh, kind of heat maps. Uh, we were able to optimize the delivery routes because we had limited human resource to deliver vaccines. Uh, we reduced the transportation time. And we also, because we had limited number of nurses available, we had only 45 for 700, 670 plus. Uh, you know, we, we this whole geo-enabled microplanning process helped us reduce their travel time so they could go to two sessions a day. And from the first year itself, you know, from 43.8%, you know, in the first year, we jumped up to 69.8%, both through surveys and through data as well, MS data. And, and you know, there has been a continued improvement in the subsequent years. So that's a lot of learning through utilization of this uh, geo-enabled microplanning process. Next slide. And uh, that's my final slide. And I'd like to acknowledge for the Department of Health and State of Society coming to Bihar, India. Uh, WHO and PSP, which helped me us with the data of house-to-house -house vaccination team, UNICEF field of the Bihar, of which I was a part, uh, the Bihar Remote Sensing Application Center, which gave us the satellite maps, and the Global Immunization Div uh, Division, CDC Atlanta, which gives us the technology and technical support. So with that, I'd like to end. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pradna. Um, Pradhan. So uh, j just a, a comment on that, uh, you know, this um, whole initiative, the, the Geo-Enabled Microplanning Handbook started as uh, a response for, for COVID and, and part of the COVAX initiative. And we were looking at this as in um, the, the motivation was uh, emergency response. But from the very beginning, we understood and we had a strong goal to make sure that uh, whatever we created in this document was just as applicable towards long-term sustainable programs, towards routine immunization. So it's very important to have this use case as part of the, the guidance that we've created and to look at how um, it can be used on, on everyday programs going in, in every country in the world. So thank you very much. And the last lightning talk that we have here is Derek Pollard from ACROS. Uh, thank you for being with us and I'll, I'll pass it to you. Thanks, Chris, and uh, hi to everyone listening in. Um, I will be talking about the power of geospatial data for public health decisions and the geo-enablement of end-to-end -end campaign planning and management, focusing in on a case study from the Zambian Vector Control Program. Next slide. Indoor res residual spraying and insecticide-treated nets have been Zambia's primary vector control tools against malaria with the goal of achieving 100% vector control coverage. Uh, this means that reaching, reaching and protecting even the remotest settlements like the one we see here. 
However, a number of challenges exist in Zambia that we see mirrored across the region. And these include poor estimation and geospatial knowledge of population and structures planning, uh, limitations in the planning and monitoring of campaigns uh, coverage at the settlement level, and limitations in knowing whether campaigns actually reached targeted settlements, and when they do, uh, if they were effectively delivered or not. And all this means is missed communities, sustained malaria transmission, and sustained morbidity and mortality. Next slide, please. So during the 2021 season, the National Malaria Program and Partners strategically applied a suite of digital geospatial tools providing high quality resource allocation during planning, deployment, and monitoring that were essential for successful implementation of the national strategy. Next slide. Um, ACROS supported the Zambia program to microplan for its IRS and ITN campaigns using detailed maps with population and structure count estimates down to the settlement area level. To start, um, ACROS engaged health facilities to map and verify their catchment boundaries of all 116 catchments in Zambia. Using these accurate boundaries, Grid3 data was used to derive settlement level and health facility level population and structure estimates. And then these estimates were further refined using field verified data capture captured through um, the reveal tool. After piloting and refining, maps were created and distributed alongside a user guide template to support the program's resource planning activities down to health facility level. The outcome was to ensure available resources were applied where they were needed most, and really to ensure that all communities were accounted for in planning. Next slide, please. In 21 high priority distri districts supported by PATH and PMI, the Reveal Geospatial Platform was used alongside IRS operations to enhance accountability for vector control coverage by firstly guiding field teams to targeted settlements that were defined during micro planning. Secondly, to provide real time offline spatial feedback to field teams to ensure that high coverage and high impact was achieved in each settlement reached. And lastly, to identify and guide any mop up, mop -up activities uh, to missed structures during the first round of the campaign. Next slide, please. The impact of digital and geospatial data on the vector control strategies in Zambia has been well documented. Uh, in this particular use case, mapping supported microplanning, uh, minimized the co-deployment of ITNs and IRS, and ma maximized the population reached across the country. National staff are now rethinking indicators used to measure vector control coverage to ensure that decision-making around planning and targeting for interventions includes entire population communities uh, and to ensure no one is left behind. Um, we have also seen an increased adherence by the field teams to only deliver to targeted settlements, which has resulted in more real, realistic uh, micro planning as a, a secondary impact. And lastly, increased coverage uh, and significant reductions in the cost per case averted have also been achieved. So as a result, um, ACROS has implemented similar geo-enabled approaches for integrated campaign planning in other countries across the region and across other health programs. And to end with, we're seeing a growing demand for granular geospatial approaches like these that can really add value to health planning and deployment. And this, hand, this handbook will certainly be an asset moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Very much appreciated this perspective. Uh, and a big thank you to all of our um, Lightning Talk speakers. Uh, I also want to say a word of thanks to uh, one more. Uh, Novelty was uh, going to speak today. Uh, they were ready and put a lot of effort into this. And uh, because of, uh, um, you know, we had a, another speaker open up uh, an opportunity to talk. Uh, we weren't able to go to Novelty, but I want to thank them for their participation in this uh, as well. Um, okay, so with that, uh, I'd like to wrap up and share a, a few final words with you. 
Um, but for those of you that don't know me, my, my name is Chris Jung, um, and I have been involved in this microplanning handbook initiative since the beginning, uh, kind of in, in the middle of 2021. Um, this event is uh, really the, the bringing together and, and the celebration of that work uh, and, and an opportunity for us to get the word out. Um, so we, I want to uh, just a little bit talk about that. Um, the, the welcome and introduction remarks from our, our core partners uh, and our organizing, um, our, our, you know, coordinating organizations was very helpful in setting the stage for why this work is crucial um, for the, the other programs that we have support, um, as, as well as for developing uh, the, the capacity within countries to take this forward on their own for, for various other needs. Um, the presentation, uh, I hope, sparked your interest for understanding more about the technical and programmatic aspects of geo-enabled microplanning. And then these lightning talks were an example of use cases of how these tools, technologies, approaches uh, have been used already in a variety of countries, uh, in different contexts, in different uh, disease burdens. And we hope we can that you can see uh, yourself in some of those use cases uh, and how the, those examples can be applicable towards how you might put this to use um, for yourself. So this handbook overall is uh, an important opportunity to bring together this community of practice that we've created uh, to work on geo-enablement. Um, and the handbook really is the consolidation of the state-of-the-art knowledge of so many people that have been uh, working in this field, developing uh, these technologies, uh, and really working on the practical application of those technologies. Uh, as such, uh, this is not done in a vacuum. Uh, we mentioned earlier, but uh, I'll re reiterate that this builds on the work of many others, uh, several guidance documents that have been published before. Um, I encourage all of you to take a look at the references section, especially the key references. Um, and there's so many documents that uh, highlight really the foundation uh, that, that we've stepped uh, into here. Uh, and one in particular that I'll call out is um, the our WHO's uh, immunization unit, IVB, has created a guide for microplanning for COVID-19. And we see this as really a companion document uh, to talk about the geo-enablement of that microplanning. So um, I would like to thank all of the contributing authors who participated in creating this handbook. We mentioned 124 people, at least that many have been involved here. Um, and all of you are experts in your field. This could not have been done without this huge coordination effort to do that. Um, I want to thank all of you who participated in this launch, our guest speakers today, uh, especially uh, the, the people who could presented uh, the, the use cases. Um, a big thank you to the launch event team. Uh, this was quite a bit of work to put together. Our colleagues at Dev Global did the coordination, and we thank them for uh, organizing the webinar and, and uh, helping with the, the presentation and the organization. Um, our colleagues at the GIS Center for Health uh, with uh, Joe Bellinger, Denise Ferris, Ana Lorenzo, uh, Ravi, of course, Rocco's guidance from UNICEF has been uh, instrumental uh, across here. And the, the whole team that put this together, uh, a big thank you for that. So next, I would like to encourage all of you to read the handbook. Uh, obviously, that's where we want this to go. Uh, we want this knowledge to be disseminated, and that starts with it uh, entering all of you. Uh, please share widely with your colleagues, uh, especially at the country level, uh, the regional level. If um, you would like us to move forward with that, um, we can provide technical assistance to country offices, to ministries of health. Um, so it, actually, if you go to the slide before, we have the contact information there. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we, we did collect the questions here in the Q&A. Uh, we will type up answers to those and publish those alongside the, uh, the recording of this webinar on our website. Um, you can reach out to us at these uh, emails. Um, 
feel free to reach out to WHO or UNICEF or any of the other people that contributed here to the, the, um, the launch today. Um, we are more than happy to uh, engage in a, in a deeper fashion um, with your programs, uh, your organizations and your countries to actually develop some rich work based off of this uh, document. Um, it was mentioned before that we do have an intention to make this a living document and create further versions of this. Uh, the step that needs to happen first there is for countries to continue to use this, these programs. Uh, we've seen good examples of how this has been done um, with uh, six use cases and many others. Uh, and we would like to, to have collect some more uh, and some feedback on how this handbook is helping your programs uh, and how it could be improved. Um, so uh, we can offer technical advice and technical guidance. We can offer programmatic support. Uh, we can have discussions about where you might do resource mobilization. Um, and we'd be happy to just discuss uh, any aspect of the handbook. Um, thank you for joining us and, and giving us your time and attention today. Uh, and with that, uh, I wish you well. Goodbye. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Goodbye.